the mayor is only making 96% of his previous salary. And all of this is not new math. I mean, if, if you're thinking as we're going through this, is this supposed to be the new stuff we're going to do today? It's not. This is the composition stuff that we did over the last two days. We say, hey, this is what we have. This is the increase that they're going to make to this. This is not 100% X, or it would have come out to be 1X. It, it's not working. So that's the mistake in the headline. And like I said, they're going to have to retract this and say something like he's making 4% less than he was before. He is making 4% less than he was two years ago. And in small towns, actually, this is exactly what has happened over the last 10 years or so during the recession. Um, a lot of mayors in small towns said in one point that we just don't have the money for a big salary like this. So uh, cut a little bit of my salary in a few years, try to make it up to me, uh, and go that way. So they tried to use inverses. They said, OK, well, we took the 20% the first year. Now let's just give them 20% back. But it, it doesn't work that way. And what we have to do is figure out, well, how do you undo something like that? You know, how do you find an inverse for that function? So if a relation pairs elements A of the domain to elements B of its range, the, what on earth are they talking about? They're saying if we make a table of x and y values to graph something, then the x's here are really the domain. That's what x is. x is the input. And the y's are the range. The cool thing about inverse functions, they just reverse those. The x's become the y's and the y's become the x's. So an inverse relation is just totally backwards graphing. is really what it is. So if we have x's and y's for our original function, when we go to graph the inverse, we just make it y, x. Switch the two around. That's all they do. So a relation with a, b as an ordered pair, its inverse is going to map to be a. Now why on earth does it do that? Because to undo an inverse, we reflect it in the line y equals x. Now it's been a while since you guys studied linear algebra. You may have forgotten. But y equals x is the line that goes through 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. It's the perfect diagonal for the first and third quadrant. That's what it is. So if you reflect over that line, this is exactly what happens. A, B becomes B, A. They, they flip. So if both the relation and its inverse are functions, then we can call them inverse functions. So here's a little bit of uh, memory to get the synapses going again. What on earth is a function? A function where every input there's exactly one output. You put one number in, you get one number out. And again, sometimes our mind says, well, when isn't that going to happen? Well, if we have y equals plus or minus the square root of x, we're going to get two outputs every time we put one value. So for functions, if the original is a function and when you get done, your inverse is a function, then we can call them inverse functions of each other. So on the next page, it says, our essential understanding is the inverse of a function may or may not be a function. Um, and just thinking right away, if this is our original, when we find the inverse, our inverse is going to involve taking the square root. It's not going to be a function. Because it says, put a number in, and I'll give you two answers. A positive answer and a negative answer. So this one, not a function. So the original is, but the inverse would be. And that happens. So like it says, it may or may not be a function. This diagram shows a relation R, a function, and its inverse, which is not a function over here. The 
range of the relation is the domain of the inverse, and the domain of the relation is the range of the inverse. So here's what they did. Here's your x's and here's your y's right here. This one is a function because if I put 1.2 in, I get 1, and 1 is one number. If I put 1.4 in, I get 1, one number. 1 1.6 in, I get 2, it's one number. Put 1.9 in, I get 2, it's one number. But when we reverse these two, so we take these and we flip them around, that gives us that. We see that if you put 1 in, now you're getting two answers out of this one. You're going to get a 1.2 in and a 1 so this one is not a function. And it happens. You know, it, it just depends on what your original is, whether or not you're going to have an inverse that is also a function. So problem one says, let's just get busy seeing how this works. It says uh, finding the inverse of a relation. What's the inverse of relation S? Well, there's S. All I have to do is flip the X's and Y's. So I'll call this inverse of S, and I'll just go through and switch the X's and the Y's. Originally it was 0, negative 1, so it's going to be negative 1, 0. 2, 0 is now 0, 2. 3, 2 is now 2, 3. And 4, 3 is now 3, 4. Done. Table. All you have to do is flip flop. That's it. X's become Y's and Y's become X's. So here it says, well, let's take a look at this graph then. You know, let's let's use these points. Not got it. My page is so big I can't even see those points anymore. So let's put relation S is already on there. Let's put our inverse in there. Negative one zero. <coughs> zero two. 2, 3, and 3, 4. There it is. Now, I can't really see that that's a really good reflection through the line y equals x unless I put them both on the same line. So you don't have to do this with your notes, but I'm going to go ahead and put those points on with the original. Because what I need you to see is the way we get those points graphically <coughs> is a reflection on the back. Should be equal but opposite on the other side of this line. Obviously, I've got the graph is perfect. But that's the line y equals x. This is the line that goes through 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, etc. And that's how we get those inverses. We reflect them over the line y equals x. So down here it says, what are the graphs of t and its inverse? Well, I see t over there. I'm going to graph that one first. Let's go ahead and graph t. Let's see what we get. So we've got 0, negative 5. Anybody not like that that's going vertical like that? We're kind of messing with our m a little bit there. But remember, it's just x's and y's. So 0, negative 5. 1, negative 4, 2, negative 3, and 3, negative 3. There it is. Well, now we want the inverse. do to get all our points for the inverse? Switch the x and the y. So it'll be negative 5, 0, negative 4, 1, negative 3, 2, and negative 3, 3. And just grab that. I'm on there, that's part A. Part B says, is t a function? Well, remember we can use the vertical line test in the graph. 
vertical line to go through any of these points. It'll just hit it once. This is a function. That one works. Is our inverse a function? Uh -uh. Hopefully everybody's seeing that spot right there at x equals negative 3. That is going to fail the vertical line test because we'll have two points on that line. So this is no, it fails the VLT, the vertical line test. Two ways to tell if it's a function. You can use the definition and say for every input there has to be exactly one output. So we could have gone to the table and said, oh, nope, this isn't a function because for negative three you're going to get both a two and a three. But if the graph vertical line test is a really fast and easy way to check. If it hits in more than one spot, it's not a function. So, failed the BLT. The graphs of the original and its inverse are reflections in the line y equals x. I don't know if you have a highlighter with or maybe you want to grab one from the bank, but that is huge. That's how we get the inverses. The graphs are reflections in the line y equals x. It's huge. That's why we can take x and y and swap those two out because that's what reflecting over the line y equals x does. To describe the equation for the inverse of a relation of a function, I like this button, switch the x and the y and solve for y. So we don't want to graph it and then find the points and then come up with an equation for the points. We want to say here's our function, Here's an easy way to get the inverse. This is it. You switch the x and the y, and you solve for y. That's how you get your inverse function. So on the top of the next page, because this is basically the whole lesson, you're finding inverses, we're going to fill in these little boxes with switch the x and the y and solve for y. And whenever I ask you how do we find the inverse, your answer should be switch the x and the y and solve for y. What we do. It doesn't matter what the function looks like. It doesn't matter if it's an x squared. If it's x to the 71st, it makes no difference. We are going to switch the x and the y, and we are going to solve for y. That's how you can do a function, like the inverse of that function. Switch the x and the y, and solve for y. Finding an equation for the inverse. What is the inverse of the relation described by y equals x squared minus 1? I got to tell you, I look at this and I see yada, 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 inverse. That's what I'm looking for. What do they want me to do? Inverse. Okay, inverse. Two steps. First step, switch the x and the y. Second step. Because with inverses, remember when we reflect over the line y equals x, the x's become the y's and the y's become the x's. So the power and everything stay exactly as they are. It's just the x's and y's that switch positions. Yeah, because we've got to solve for y. So we're going to add one to both sides. We want this y all by itself. Still not by itself, but super close. Square root. Now, whenever we physically write down a square root, that means we need the plus or minus piece. There it is. Switch the x and the y and solve for y. That's the inverse. Now, I don't know about you, but every once in a while I can be found at kind of a doubting Thomas. So what I'm going to do is uh, graph this and see. The original is x squared minus 1. Okay, 6 looks like that. And then I just kind of imagine what would happen if I flipped that over this line. So this is going to come way over here. This one will come over here. So it should look kind of sideways. All right, so let's see here. If I go to the next one and I say, um, I want the square root of x plus 1. 
But then I realize I'm going to be missing something because I can't put plus or minus in the calculator. I'm going to have to put it up there separate. Negative square root of x plus 1. So I can see the whole thing. There it is. So it reflected that over that diagonal of y equals x and gave us exactly what we needed. So kind of visually we could check it and say, oh yeah, that's good. That's going to do it. That would do that little reflection for me there. Switch the x and the y and solve for y. Alrighty, this one says, what is the inverse of y equals 2x plus 8? That was the word I was looking for. How do you find the inverse? Switch the x and the y. Then, solve for y. How do we do it? Subtract 8. Then what? Divide by 2. And because this one is x to the first, we probably want to mx plus b, because that means this is a line. So 1 half x minus 4. That's going to be y. Done? No, you can always check visually. So let's see here. Go back into my y equals. All right, so I had 2x plus 8, just like that. Kind of visualize, okay, if I had to go, it's just going to be another line. It'll be about right there. And you're saying that should be 1 half x minus 4. Oh, yeah. Looks like it's reflected over that group of diagonal, that first and third quadrant. So down here, uh oh, looks like we did it more difficult. What are the graphs of y equals x squared minus 1 and its inverse? y equals plus or minus the square root of x plus 1. Okay. Um, well, if everybody remembered earlier in the year, you would know exactly what this looks like right now. Can anybody describe to us what y equals x squared minus 1 is? It's a parabola. Where is it going to be centered at? 0, negative 1. Yeah. So if you remember all that, then we wouldn't have to do this. But we can certainly, if you're not remembering, Make ourselves a little bitty table to get our memory going. Say, okay, I'd have to square that, so it'd be 0 squared. 0 squared minus 1 is negative 1. 1 squared is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 1 is 3. 3 squared is 9. 9 minus 1 is 8. Because we want us to graph it so we can see it. So 0, negative 1. 1, 0, 2, 3. And 3, 8. And of course, we know this is a parabola, so we could just use symmetry and go equal but opposite on the other side. So there's a y equals x squared minus 1. And now the other one, we haven't had much use for square roots at this point. Because up until inverses, we didn't need to know a whole lot about it. So with this, we definitely would make a table. And we'd have to think this through a little bit. We'd say, okay, would it be good to put 0 in here? Well, yeah, because 0 plus 1 is 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. Yep, that would be a good one. So we could put 0 in there. Um, another number to put in there? Well, not 1, because 1 plus 1 is 2. The square root of 2 is something, not something nice. Wouldn't want to put a 2 in there. Square root of 3 is not something nice, but 3, now that would be a nice number, because that would be the thing. So I think ahead to my next perfect square, which would be 9, and I realize, hey, if I put an 8 in there, 8 plus 1, put a square root of 9. So a 0 in here is 0 plus 1. Square root of that is 1, so this would be plus or minus 1. And then I put 3 in there, and 3 plus 1 is 4. The square root of that is Put an 8 in there, 8 plus 1 is 9, square root of 9, 3. But then I think back to what we were doing yesterday when we were talking about domains. 
and I realized there is a smaller number I could use in this besides zero. What's the one smaller number? Negative one. If I put negative one plus one in here, that'll be the square root of zero. And what's zero? Square root of zero is zero. So we could put negative one and zero in here. So this graph is actually going to start at that negative one zero. And then we're going to have zero plus or minus one. So we're going to go one above and one below and graph that. And then we'll have over three and up two and down two. And then we'll have over eight and up three. And now three. And hopefully some of you are thinking, well, couldn't we just like reverse this? Because they're inverses of each other? Well, we didn't, I mean it tells us they're inverses, but we wouldn't get both branches doing that because they want that little plus or minus piece in there. So better probably to just make a table couple of times and feel like you're used to it before you go on and do anything else. So here's what I notice about this. It's got this arching thing going on here and that plus one in there actually meant that we were going to move it one to the left. That's right, that's H. Remember our A, H, and K? This is H. So that's the opposite of whatever we see. Whatever we see with X always reacts the opposite of what we think. So when we see a plus one, that really means it's moving left one when we do that. So nice little graph going there. <coughs> oh, yeah, let's do this one because this isn't going to take very long. This is a line. You guys know how I graph lines. Got a little y equals mx plus b action going with this one. So what's the slope? 2 over 1, yeah, we're going to use 2 over 1 because we're graphing. What's our B value? We do these alphabetically, so we start with the B. B is always the Y intercept, so we're going to go up to 8. Oops, that's 9, that's not 8. And from there, we use the slope to get some more points. So we're going up 2 and over 1. Oh no, we ran off the grid. We'll just use the slope backwards. So we'll go back one and down two. Gives you something to aim at. So that's y equals 2x plus 8. But they didn't tell us what the inverse is this time. So we have to remember there's two steps to find in the inverse. What's the first step? Switch the x and the y. Second step. Solve for y. All right, so how are we getting y by itself? Subtract an 8. Then divide by 2. And since we know this is a line, we want to do that in y equals mx plus b form. So x divided by 2 would be 1 half x. And negative 8 divided by 2 would be negative 4. So, if we're going to graph this, what are we using for m? And where are we starting? At negative 4. All right, so 1, 2, 3. There's negative 4. Go up 1 and over 2 a couple of times. Giving yourself something to aim at. that makes sense. Because remember, we're going to reflect over this perfect diagonal y equals x. 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. So this flops down here. There it is. Cool. So the inverse of a line in line. That works out nice. We don't want to graph those. That's excellent. The inverse of a function, we're going to have to write a little bit. And that's because Y doesn't say, hey, this is special, this is a function. So the inverse of a function, we're going to write f to the negative 1. And I know that looks like a power, and that's going to mess with your head, but those are the symbols 
that we use for the inverse. So that means the inverse of f. It doesn't mean raise it to the negative one power. It's the inverse of f. So if they give us functions with function notation, instead of writing y equals blah, 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 we're supposed to change it to f inverse equals. But all the math is the same. The first thing we do is switch the x and the y and solve for y. It's just at the very end, we're going to throw in this nice fancy notation. That's all. So, let's save this one for Monday, but let's go to the word problem, because the word problem is, is not bad. It is a little out of order, just because I want to save the, the tougher stuff for you on Monday so it's not forgotten over the weekend. When we are finding the inverse of a real world problem, uh-oh, we have a problem. You can't switch the variables. That's because they stand for something. You know, if it's area equals one half base times height, you can't suddenly say, oh, I know I'll make the base and height reversible. No, one is still the base and one is the height. We can't change that. So here's what we do. We just solve for what's called the independent variable. Now that's a big fancy word for the variable that's not already solved for. Variable not already solved for. So let me give you the for instance here. They have a equals pi r squared. That's already solved for a. You, you can't solve for a. It's already solved for a. It says a equals blah, blah, blah. But we can solve it for i. Because r is sitting over there with the pi and the squared piece on it. So we wouldn't change the variables. We'd just say, all right, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a equals pi r squared, and I'm going to get r all by itself. All right. Um, the pi has to go. That's, that's being multiplied, so we're going to divide. So we'll have a over pi equals r squared. But I wanted r all by itself, so I'm going to have to take the square root of both sides, and that gives me plus or minus the square root of a over pi equals r. But then one last thinking step. R is the radius of a circle. Can you have a negative radius to a circle? So that plus or minus thing doesn't make any sense. That happens quite a bit with word problems. You know, you get to a point where you say, oh, I know I'm supposed to put plus or minus here, so I'm just going to put plus or minus there. But it's a word problem. So that's going to be the inverse. So notice, this one will solve for area. Its inverse will solve for the radius. That's just what we do. You don't need to switch the variables around. You just solve for the one that's not already solved for. So problem five says we're going to find the inverse of a function talking about a crazy person that goes cliff diving. Where'd they get that nutso person at? Dangerous! The function d equals 4.9t squared. Oh my. Represents the distance d in meters that an object falls in t seconds due to Earth's gravity. Find the inverse of this function. I'm not even going to read the rest, but find the inverse of this function. So what do we need to solve for? t. How are we going to get it by itself? Divide by 4.9. Square root. Can time be negative? No. So we're just going to leave it as positive square root here. d over 4.9 equals t. So what we really want to find out here is, would the person have to take a breath to continue their scream? Because if I'm going off a cliff, I'm screaming. I don't know about you. At some point, you're going to run out of air. It's how long are they screaming for? That's what I want to know. So, we're putting the 24 in there. We're going to see, is this a one breath screamer or is this a two breath screamer? 24 <coughs> over 4.9 equals T. Square root of that. All right. That was a nice 
makes the most to have that nice formula put that in there. Make that really fast. 24 divided by 4.9. Oh, well, on is helpful. Second square root, 24 divided by 4.9. 2.21 seconds. Okay, so. Ah, yeah, that's one, one breath scream. I didn't need any more screams in there. It had to be much higher to make it a two breath scream. We got it. So there's one down here that you're going to talk me through. This little function, d equals b squared over 19.6, relates the distance in meters that an object has fallen to its velocity. There's a science thing. You're trying to find velocity in meters per second. Find the inverse. What do you do? <coughs> Multiply by 19.6. Exactly. This one is being divided this time. Then what? Square root? Okay. Now, velocity can be negative. And in your science class, your teacher is going to make sure that you label this as negative something since it's going down. But our book ignores the positive and negative, which it probably should have, but it does. So we're just going to use the positive square root. Or we can figure this out if we know how far they're falling. Hey, they gave us that in picture. What was it? 24. Okay, so square root of 19.6 times 24. So I can square root 19.6 times 24. About 21.69 meters per second. Now that doesn't mean a whole lot to us. We could take some time and that into miles per hour, but it's more important that we're able to focus on our inverse here so we can figure that out. So give me a 43210. How are you feeling so far about switching the x and the y and solving for a while? Okay, so pretty good numbers. So tell me what we can't do when it's a word problem. We can't switch the variables. We can't switch the variables. So it's all right, you just solve for the one that's not solved for. It's just with word problems, you can't switch the variables. That's going to be the key. So what I need to do is I need to give you the homework assignment, and then I need to uh, give you a couple of things and talk through the extra credit. That's why, I, like I said, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on FAQs because I wanted to give us some time here and we can go through that. So write that little puppy down. away for the people that are done today. So Maddie and oh well I'm left before I could get her into. Alright, so the extra credit. Um, you're gonna get two things. The first one, this is for you to take the notes along with the video. So when you get this one, plop your name on there and maybe write a little note to well write notes on it. So you remember this is the one that's just for you to take notes. This extra credit video is going to be a quick reminder on the Pythagorean here and on your special 30, 60, 90, 45, 45, 90 triangles, which we learned this long ago. And um, what else? Sokotoa. A little bit of a uh, Sokotoa from Giovanni in here. So, again, put your name on this one and write yourself. 